Well, well, well the, uh, the issue of early Shabbos, of course, we have a, we have a Yarchi Kala going on. In fact, sometimes uh, we have so many different programs going on simultaneously. There's the Mentors Mission JLE, there's Yarchi Kala, which is a totally independent program, and uh, whatever it is, the things are going all over the place. I, I don't always know where I'm supposed to be at any, any given time, or sometimes I'm supposed to be in three places at any given time. But uh, the, the sugya in the Yarchi Kala is about starting Shabbos early. And uh, those of you from the United States are probably familiar with the idea that in the summer, uh, many shoals have a thing of starting Shabbos early. And uh, there are many halachic issues about it that have to be discussed. And I'm not, I'm not sure if I want to do this now. Uh, but the point was that uh, the poskim of Eretz Yisrael were not in favor of starting Shabbos early. Well, or to put it another way, you can start Shabbos early, that's a mitzvah. But they were not in favor of early Mayrib. They were not in favor of early Kiddush. They were not in favor of uh, early Sa'uda. So therefore, the minig in Eretz Yisrael was that uh, Shabbos was not made early. Now, the truth is, in Eretz Yisrael, it's not so much of a problem as it would be in Chutz Laaretz, simply because the, um, the, di the distance, the time between Shkia and night is much uh, shorter here. So Shabbos would not be quite as late as it would be. So uh, when someone asked Rebbe Yashiv about an early Shabbos, he says, well, it's fine, except for Myriv, Kiddush, Seuda, you know, he said one more thing. Myriv, Kiddush, he said three things. Kriyashma, Myriv, Seuda, and Kiddush, everything else is great. Um, so the truth of the matter is the identical problems are true in Chutz Laaretz as well. But Chutz Laaretz, the minag was to follow the Mekilim. In Eretz Yisrael, the minag was to follow the Machmirim. So uh, when you come and you're trying to do what you did in America, which was not the minig of Eretz Yisrael, so some might say it's not a proper thing to do. That, that's all. But again, I think you would follow the guidance of your Rav in Eretz Yisrael regarding whether that should be so. I know perhaps in a case like your, your, your case about, uh, up in Afula, so you're talking about a new kehila. So a new kehila is not necessarily bound by the pre-existing minhagim of the makam, because they are a new kehila, so there may be more of a grounds to be lenient. Really, they also made an early minion, and it could be because we did, but they, they also made their own one, so I don't know yeah. if that helps. Or no, that's what I'm saying. I mean, as I was suggesting, I was suggesting that a kehila, a newly established kehila, might be free to establish their own minhag. <coughs> yeah. Um, I think... Uh, the Torah and Pasha of Kedosh and Emma commands us to leave over corners of our fields for the poor. I understand we for those who don't have. Why does the Torah include the ger in this mitzvah? He or she may be wealthy. Why does the Torah not include an Alman or a Yosef? Yeah, so the question was, just repeat the question, that we know that there is a mitzvah in the Torah uh, when you have a field in Eretz Yisrael of Leket, Shech, and Peya. Uh, leaving the corners of the fields for the poor, uh, leaving uh, sheaves of uh, pieces of grain, stalks of grain that fell as you were harvesting them, or sheaves of grain that you have forgotten, that's leket, shechach, They are to be left to the poor. Let me just give a little point of information. You do have to differentiate leket, shechach, and peya from things like tztaka, maiserani, or truma, and maiser. Because sadaka, maiserani, which goes to the poor, and uh, truma and maiser, uh, even though you have to give them, but you have the zechus to decide who you want to give it to. Maiserani. I don't have to give it to the first poor guy that shows up. I could say I'm holding it back to give to another ani. Leket she this is called tova sana. Tova sana is the right to decide who will get it. Truma, maiser, I decide who will get it. Leket shech and peya, you have no rights to whatsoever. You have to leave it to the Ani. The only Eitzah you have to prevent an Ani from getting it is to declare all of your property Hefker, so you become an Ani for two minutes, and then you can take the Lekha Chich and Pei, and then even if you reacquire your property, you're okay. So there's no Tova Sana in Lekha Chich and Pei. So the question that was raised was, it says uh, you leave it for the Ani, which is fine, leave it for the poor person, but it mentions also the Ger, the Ger. Now, the ger, meaning a person who converts to Judaism, is lav daf kapor. Not every ger will be able to uh, take leket shechen peya. Uh, he, he might run a, run a hedge fund or, or anything else. 
Uh, but the short answer is that it's really just referring to the idea that uh, in the times of the Torah, uh, wealth was primarily based on ownership of land. And a ger could not really own land in Eretz Israel. A ger typically had no land. And if that was the primary source of wealth, a stam ger, maybe not so today, but a stam ger would qualify as, as an oni. And so you may then ask me the question, so let the Torah just say oni. Why does it have to say lo oni vo la ger? So the answer, I think, might be that if it wouldn't say a ger specifically, you might have had a hava amina that I could discriminate in favor of the Jewish poor, or you know, the born Jewish poor. Meaning, if a ger wants to take lecture and pay I might say, sorry, this is reserved for born Jews. So by mentioning specifically, it belongs to the ani and the ger, that does not mean a ger that's not an ani, but it means an ani that is a born Jew and an ani that is a ger Jew are equal uh, rights, equal entitlements in the Leket, Shech, and Peya, and therefore uh, you're not allowed to prevent the Ger from taking Leket, Shech, and Peya. Right? So that would be why it, why it mentions that. But a Stam Ger would have been an Ani at the time. Yeah? Should we hold by the Mechira? <laughs> well, Baruch Hashem is a little early. We have a few years to uh, c consider this. Hetra Mechira, again, just for the uh, just for you, everyone knows what it is, uh, was the Great, great innovation. Rav Kook did not invent the Hedger Mechir. The Hedger Mechir was actually employed before Rav Kook, but Rav Kook institutionalized it and he popularized it. And he wrote a wonderful, wonderful sefer, Sh uh, Shabbat HaOretz, which is, uh, it's interesting. The introduction is the much more, I mean, the sefer is actually a commentary on the halachas of Shemit of the Rambam, but he's mocked him with a hakdama about the Hetra Mechira. And it's the Hakdama that is really the biggest, the most important part of the, of the Sefer. And uh, Rav Kook wrote it, I don't know, the, you know, the early, very early decades of the 20th uh, century. And uh, the Rabbanut has been following the Hetra Mechira of selling the land to non-Jews, the way we sell chametz, and that would permit uh, Jewish farmers to farm it, and uh, the Peros would not have the Shemitah restrictions that you normally have. This is Hetra Mechira, and Rav Kook endorsed it. So if you're asking me, should you rely on Hetra Mechira, the short answer is you should not. However, there are many, many, many levels here. So for example, if you're invited to someone's house who does rely upon it, then there are reasons to say that for Shalom, you're permitted to rely upon it, and, and, and the like. So Hetra Mechira is one of those halachic issues in which there is a solid halachic basis for it. It's not like treif. People sometimes talk about hetra mechira uh, like, you know, he says, oh, yeah, I have so much sorrows for my children. One child converted to Christianity and another child, you know, has hetra mechira and, you know, <laughs> I don't know which is worse. It, you know, it's not that type of issue. Hetra mechira does have an absolutely solid basis in halacha, but lechatechila, it's better not to rely upon it unless you have a particular reason. Uh, I also want to point out, too, that even if you're going to rely on Hetra Mechira, there's a Chumrah superimposed on that, L'Chatchila, you should still try to eat the produce with the laws of Shemitah, although a pure Hetra Mechira person would actually say, there is no Kedusha Shviyas, but the Chalapachas, there would be an Indian to at least have that Chumrah even within the Hetra. Um, it's very unfortunate, again, I don't, I don't want to get hate mail about this, uh, that halachic issues are politicized sometimes when there's no reason to be politicized. Yes, the machlokas about Hetra Mechira, and we should discuss the machlokas and discuss the makoros and debate the makoros. But it shouldn't be a sign, are you from, are you not from? Um, I mean, I'll give you one example. Shlomo Zalman Orbach, one of the great, great Gedolia Poskim, uh, wrote a safer on Hilchos uh, Shemitah, Madanei Aretz. And uh, the first edition, Madanei Aretz, that was published in his lifetime back in the 1940s or 50s, I think, number one, contained a Haskama from Rav Kook. Rav Kook was not alive anymore, but he had gotten the Haskama years before. And number two, contained a, at least a partial validation of the Hedger Mechira, meaning Rav Shlomo Zalman said exactly what I just said, that 
It's better not to be so on it, but there are certainly strong bases that it's okay. Uh, around 30 years later, after his death, they issued a new edition of Matone Oritz, in which they added a lot of things. So, Baruch Hashem, they added a lot of things. But they didn't tell you, they took out a few things, too. And among the two things they took out is, they took out the Haskama of Rav Kook, and they took out Rav Shlomo Zalman's, at least partial, validation of the Heter Mechira. So they boasted about the Hosafot that they put in. They didn't tell you about the things that they took out. Uh, so it was interesting that another group got hold of the original Madonna Yaretz and reprinted. So in different Svarim stores, you can get two different versions of the same Sefer, basically. One was the first edition that contains the Heter Mechira language, but not some of the Hosafot, which are very valuable. Or you can get the Hosafot. So maybe if you want Rav Shlomo Zalman's complete picture of Shemitah, you're going to have to get uh, both, uh, both volumes. So it is very, very unfortunate because uh, this is not a political, this should not be a political issue. Uh, this should be a halachic, halachic issue. And uh, my accusation of making it political is really on both sides of the equation. On one hand, those who are mitnaged lahetu mechira say that the other side don't care about halacha. And on the other side, those who support the Hetzir Mechira will accuse the yeshiva or Haredi world of not caring about the farmers of Eretz Yisrael. In other words, each one is, all is uh, hurling accusations against the other, and that is not really the proper way to approach this. This is a very, very yesodistic machokis and halacha, and really, I mean, it's based on Gomorrahs, but in terms of poskim, it goes back to a big machlokas between the Mabit and, and the Beis Yosef, going all the way back to the 1500s. These are two gedolei olam mamish, Mabit, Moshe ben Yosef Trane, who is the head of the Basin of Svats, and Rav Yosef Cairo, who is the Rav of Svats. So the whole Hetra Mechira in Broglio goes back to the machlokas, the Mabit, and the Beis Yosef, and it should be addressed that way. Yeah. So in Parshas Ekev at the beginning, it speaks about, uh, it says Ekev as mitzvahs that, that you Dutch can back up, yeah. So what has Rebbe, through Rebbe's experience of life, found that in our generation are maybe some mitzvahs that, that we can maybe really have some prison? Yeah, so the question was, the Torah says, Ekev Tishmon, uh, you have to observe the heel, that's the drush of Chazal, and Rashi says that refers to the mitzvahs that people step on with their heel, that's an expression, that means things that they consider not important. In reality, they're very important, but it's bedavka, those mitzvahs that are neglected, that one needs to pay attention to. So the truth of the matter is there's, um, so if you ask me just for examples, I mean, each person has his own examples. I'm not sure I could generalize, uh, but certainly uh, things like Loshon Hara uh, fall into those categories. Uh, not being honest in business. In fact, it's interesting. Lashon Hara, Baruch Hashem, in recent decades, there's been a greater awareness of it. I mean, the Chavitz Chaim brought the awareness to Klal Yisrael generally, but in recent decades, there's been a greater sensitivity. So I think Lamaisa, they're always having, you know, conventions and groups and videos, and uh, so Lashon Hara maybe is getting better than it was. But one thing which is not getting so good is honesty in business. Um, I encounter Shilas over and over and over again, where people are looking for new and creative ways to cheat. Cheat the government, cheat that, cheat that, cheat that. Looking for heter after heter after heter, and unfortunately getting heter after heter, heter after heter. And uh, remember that the very first question that a Kaddish Baruch is going to ask us after 120 years is, Nasasa v'nasata v'yamuna, did you conduct your business affairs with honesty? Kavata Itim Latoira, did you set aside regular times for Torah learning, is on the list too, but that's question number two. Question number one is, how honest were you in business? So I think, just based on the experience of the Shilas that I get, that uh, business ethics is Adam Dosh Biakov of people step on, people think it's just not. It's just not that important. That's a very, very big uh, chabal. Um, other things, well, I mean, again, Talmud Torah, this is tricky. 
psychologically and philosophically, everybody knows how important Talmud Torah is. So I'm not going to say psychologically people are dosh v'yakavav, but when it turns into the lamaisa of actually doing it, we sometimes uh, do take it a little, a little for granted. And of course, tefillah. Now, Baruch Hashem, a, a religious person will daven three times a day. That's not the issue. But to daven with kavana, to take your time, to think about what you're saying. The Gemara itself, already in the time of the Gemara, the Gemara in Brachis, tefillah is described as a davar ha'omed barumo shalal olam, something that is at the highest pinnacle of heaven in terms of its holiness. Uvinei adam mezalzalin bahem. And people treat it with no respect. So those would be those would be some of the examples that we have to think about. Uh, yeah. With regarding in, in with with, uh, with taxes, one spark could be instead of um, giving money to an institution that's anti torah instead I'm going to come up with innovative ways to, to to not have to pay that amount and instead give it to the miser, more miser to yeshivas or to uh, orphans, widows, and that, that could perhaps be uh, one, one reasoning um, for, for trying to save money in regard to taxes, but would that be... Um, yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, you know, this is, this is complicated, and, I, and again, I, I, I guess I, sh I should announce before every Q&A that I'm not necessarily paskining halacha lamaisa if one has a specific shayla you have to ask a rav. I might be the rav. I might not be the rav. But, but in the Q and A, I'm not necessarily going to give any psak halacha. But the issue of tax evasion, even for a good purpose, is a very interesting question. I mean, you, you raised a point which, if I were simply going with pure logic, has a great deal of cogency to it. And that is, hey, I'm going to give taxes, whether it's to the Israeli government or whether it's to the U.S. government, and some of that is going to go to abortion and gay rights and and. and transgender accommodations. Well, I'd rather not pay those taxes and give more money to yeshivos, give more money to Stuka, give more money even to my own family, to take care of my family. Uh, why should I contribute to things that are not only shtuyot, not only foolishness, but things that are you know, advancing anti-Torah agenda? So in some ways, you know, that is a strong argument. The question is whether it's a halachic argument, right? Sometimes we can have strong logical contentions, but the halacha does not accept them. So let's first, let me first talk about U.S. taxes, then I'll mention Israeli taxes, which may be a halachically different idea. So in the U, vis a vis U.S. taxes, it's fairly clear that at least if you live in the U.S., now if you don't, that's interesting, but let's take it at different levels. If I live in the United States, there is a halachic obligation to pay taxes. Uh, this is the predicate of Dina de Malchus Adina, uh, that the Amara Shmuel told us that the civil law of the country that you reside is halachically binding on you. And although the Ramah says that may not necessarily be the case vis-a-vis -vis two Jews, meaning two Jews who have a partnership, perhaps they should be governed by the Shulchan Aruch instead of Dina de Malchusa, but the Ramah says, vis-a-vis -vis your obligations to the government, such as taxation, that is the core area of Dina de Malchusa Dina. So although there is no mitzvah to be machmer on taxes, even a famous American judge, learned hand, again, it's a funny name, but uh, one of the most famous judges uh, of the 20th century made a point that he didn't say it this way, but he says, there is no Indian to be machmer on taxes. There's no heater mitzvah for taxes. So any legitimate loopholes, go ahead and do it. Uh, but to simply evade fraudulently tax liability is a violation of Dina de Malchus Adina in the United States. The interesting question is, does Dina de Malchus Adina apply if I am not a resident of that Medina? You know, uh, uh, U.S. taxes are imposed even on people who are not living, uh, American citizens who are not living in the United States. That is a very, very interesting shayla, that it may very well be that the Dina de Malchus Adina applies to somebody who is a resident of a country, is obligated to follow those laws. It may not apply extraterritorially. Again, I'm not Pashkini, I'm just 
raising that as a question. Now, even without Dina de Malchus Adina, of course, you always have to deal with the issue of potential Chilul Hashem. We have had actual, now, now you might say, well, gee, if I don't pay taxes, you know, what are the chances I'll get caught? What are the chances that people will know I'm from? What are the chances there'll be a desecration of God's name? Well, it may be relatively small. On the other hand, in the United States, there have been several spectacular cases of religious mostos and uh, yeshivos that were caught in various fraudulent financial dealings vis-a-vis the government. And it was a tremendous desecration of God's name where people look at religious Jews and they say they're dishonest and they're going to know them. Right? So those are the two issues vis-a-vis taxation in the United States. One is Dina de Malchus Adina, and there would be a question if that applies extraterritorially to a non-resident. And the second would be the more amorphous, the less definite, Chilul Hashem, which is always a consideration that we have to think about every single moment of our lives. Now, these are the Eretz Yisrael. Paying taxes in Eretz Yisrael. So, is it the same principle? So, many people bring a run in Maseches Nedorim. And the run in Maseches Nedorim does say that Dina de Malchusa Dina, that the Chiv to obey secular law, does not apply in Eretz Yisrael. And the reason the Ran gives is very interesting because in any country other than Eretz Israel, the government has the right to kick me out and deny me residency. And as a result, my residency in the land is conditional on my agreement to keep the laws. Since in Eretz Israel, halacha, halacha at least, does not recognize the power of any foreign government to expel me My residence in the land is not an implicit acceptance to Dina de Malchus Adina. This is what the Ran says. Now, based on the way I just explained it, I hope you'll see why there's a problem in how it's applied. Some people will tell you today, oh, based on the Ran, we're not mechuyav to obey the secular laws of the state of Israel. Now, keep in mind the following. When the Ran was writing, the Ran was writing in the 1300s, the so-called government that ruled over Israel was either a Christian or a Muslim government, depending on where you were, etc. And the Ran is essentially saying that doesn't have the legitimacy of a government. The Ran was not addressing a Jewish state at all. Now, if, however you take an Aturi Karta position that you recognize even the Jewish state as an illegitimate Medina and there's no right to establish a state until Mashiach. You have a legitimate argument, I don't have to pay taxes because there is no government that has the authority to impose those taxes. But if you recognize the legitimacy of a Jewish state, even if you don't like it, it's not religious or whatever it is, The Ran is certainly not going to be relevant at that point uh, because uh, the Ran is talking about non-Jewish states that have no right to control Eretz Israel. So all I'm saying is this. All I'm saying is that the Ran as a precedent for not applying Dina de Mochus in Eretz Israel is a very, very questionable use of that Ran because the Ran was not referring to a Jewish state. A Jewish state raises other issues such as legitimacy, uh, Etc. So, and of course, Chilul Hashem, to the extent it, agree, it, it exists, would still apply you know, no matter what the circumstances. So, the point that I want to raise, and again, I'm just thinking out loud, so forgive me for just cogitating over this, but the point I want to raise is do any of these factors change because of your consideration? Me- meaning, if there is indeed a chi of mitam dina to machuzina to pay taxes, is there a China that would override that because the money is going for Devara Veris. I'm very doubtful that there is actually, simply because when Chazal talked about Dina de Malchus Adina, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans, a lot of the tax money was also going to bad things. In other words, you don't find that Chazal allowed you to make an accounting 
of where your money goes. So although I hear emotionally, I, I, I hear the taina, I don't know if halachically uh, that would be the case. Somebody told me a Misa, though, it's an interesting Misa, that uh, there was a, a, a Balchuva who became a cipher. So he trained himself, he got educated, and uh, he was writing Sifre Torah, Tfilin, and Mezuzas. Now, Safras is largely a cash business, but he was an extremely honest person. So he decided he wanted to pay Bidiyuk, what the taxes are, on all the cash he, uh, he earned. So he comes into the tax office, uh, and he brings a gigantic suitcase filled with whatever it was, 100,000 shekel, whatever, all the money he earned uh, in the whole year. And he puts it down in front of the guy and says, I'd like to know what my taxes are on this money. <laughs> so he said, the guy looked at him and said, what do you want? He says, you know, I want to pay taxes on this money. He says, get out of here. I don't have time to, you know, <laughs> calculate taxes for you, you know, whatever it is. So even when the guy offers the money, you know, they don't, they don't always take it. So now, it's a little bit of an analogy to Haredim in the army, by the way, you know, just a free association. You know. On one hand, you have the Supreme Court going crazy. Haredim have to be drafted in the army. Well, do you know that indeed there were like 6,000 Haredim who wanted to go into the army, the army rejected them. So, so uh, it's an interesting issue that one hand is saying, we have to, you know, draft, 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 draft. And then the other hand, when, they actually, when some people actually show up, they often get rejected. Some had health problems, but a lot of them didn't have health problems, but just they were too much trouble. <laughs> With the Kashris and the Kalisha and a million, million different things, then, you know, listen, we don't, we don't need you. So. That may, in fact, be part of the ultimate solution. <laughs> you know, they simply don't want so that that'll that'll solve that particular issue. But okay, uh, I don't want to get get into that one. Okay, yeah. Can someone learn or develop a belief in God? Say again. Can someone learn or develop a belief in God? Yeah. Can someone learn or develop a belief in God? One hundred percent. You can absolutely do it. Uh, the biggest proof is maybe a person that's way beyond us. But that is Avraham Avinu. I mean, nobody taught Avraham Avinu about God. Avraham Avinu discovered God in various ways. And how you learn, it really, really depends. Uh, some are more philosophically oriented, so they would like to examine the philosophical arguments. Uh, many are moved by their contemplation of science. I mean, let me, let's take a person like Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein uh, was not a religious Jew, obviously, but Albert Einstein uh, had a very, very deep belief that there was a supreme intelligence that was the architect of the universe because he saw in a universe that had billions of discrete phenomena how they could all be organized in a coherent way based on a few fundamental principles. And he saw the unity that emerges from the multiplicity as an evidence of a prime cause. Now, he never took it to the next level of a personal God who gives Torah. But that's a, separate, that's a separate issue. But at least the idea of God, many see proof of God in science itself. Now, everybody talks about the conflicts between science and religion. Everyone talks about that. In reality, in many, many ways, science is, might be one of the greatest proofs of God, given the fact of scientific law. In fact, I, I have suggested that even a scientist that's an, that is an atheist is behaving as if he believes in God, even though he says he doesn't. Because what does a scientist look for? A scientist looks for scientific laws to explain nature. Why does nature act a certain way? Now, if you don't believe in God, and these things just happen, mehechi why would you assume there's any reason for anything? Who's the one that's giving the reason? In other words, even an atheist, in their quest for scientific law, is at least acting as if there is some architect of those rules. So I think science is one way of understanding it. Another is history. Study Jewish history. You know, Arnold Toynbee was a very, very famous British historian. Um, although his reputation lost some of its luster in the, the end of his life. But in the 40s and 50s, he was like the big guy. He was the Godel Hator uh, in history. And he wrote a multi-volume work called A Study in History, in which he took 50 ancient civilizations, Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians, 
uh, up to the Greeks and the Romans. And he collated all of the data and he tried to create laws that show the rise and fall of a civilization. What makes civilizations rise? What makes civilizations fall? And he identified what he thought were the laws of history. Uh, and uh, this is called the study in history. It's like 10,000 pages spread over uh, many volumes. And it, this was wonderful. He was able to explain satisfactorily 49 out of 50 ancient civilizations. The one holdout was he couldn't explain why there are Jews. Didn't make sense. They didn't have a common territory for most of the, our history. We didn't have a common language. Now, Toynbee was accused of being an anti-Semite, but you know, I have to give him a pass on this, because if I wrote 10,000 pages, and I had a beautiful, beautiful theory, and the theory uh, was supported by 49 out of 50, and it's these Jews that are slugging up, refuting my theory, I would be pretty angry too. You know, hey, you guys are ruining it. Yeah, so I'll give him, I'll give him a pass on his uh, well-known anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm just joking about that, but anyway, so, so the thing is, that Toynbee came up with this idea that the only way he could explain Klal Yisrael was there a fossil. It's like finding a, a, you know, a dinosaur fossil or something, meaning they shouldn't exist. There ought not to be Jews in the world. They don't make sense. No land, no language. Everybody tried to kill us. Everybody tried to destroy us. Why are we here? And not only we're here, we're not like, you know, aborigines in, in some cave in Australia. But Jews are, you know, prospering, productive, creative, contributing to every avenue of the world, whether religious or not religious. So Toynbee was attacked by saying, how dare he say the Jews are a fossilized people, etc. But once again, if Toynbee means that according to the laws of history, there ought not to be a Jewish people, I think our answer would be Enoch Enami. He's right. Jews are above history. We make no sense. Our existence in the world is an absurdity. And therefore, why are we here? There's a God. God has a purpose. So some get this from science. Some get this from Jewish history. And I'll give you a third source. Some get it from the, what seems to be an innate morality and consciousness or conscience within the human personality. Unless you're psycho, a psychopath, most human beings feel instinctively it's wrong to kill, it's wrong to steal. Now those of you that uh, ever read Dostoevsky, uh, Crime and Punishment, recalls the main character, Raskolnikov, who is really Dostoevsky, actually. And Raskolnikov says in one place, without God, all things are permitted. If I don't believe in God, why shouldn't I kill if it's convenient for me? Why shouldn't I steal? Now, again, you're going to tell me, well, I know plenty of atheists who, you know, they're not murderers. That's true. I'm not suggesting that an atheist is going to kill for no reason at all. In fact, I once saw... <laughs> I once saw an interview with a psychopath. This is, this is, really, this is really, it was really striking. Psychopath has no conscience at all. And this woman who was a psychopath was saying, you know, people have the wrong idea about me. I'm not going to just go into your house and cut you up. Why would I do that? That would just make a mess. That would be inconvenient. Now, if I had a reason, like, you know, you had something I wanted, yeah, I would go ahead and do it. It wouldn't bother me. But you're relatively safe. You know, psychopaths are safe people. They don't just kill for no reason at all. We have to have some reason. So the point I'm making is this. Given the fact that most human beings have conscience and morality, you have to ask yourself, where does that come from? Unless there's a God that put it in us. So whether it's science, whether it's abstract philosophy, whether it's science, whether it's Jewish history, or whether it's morality, I think these converge to make a case for God. So can a person come to understand God through that type of thinking process? I think they can. Did you want to follow up with them? What if someone says that that innate conscience came from evolution? Yes, okay. So, so, you know, again, these are things to discuss. So the question becomes, is 
and again, people will debate this, but one may make the argument, um, is morality uh, an evolutionary benefit? Uh, meaning, one argument might be that sometimes people make moral decisions that are actually injurious to them. Consider, for example, the German or the Pole or the Ukrainian that protected Jews during the Holocaust, uh, the few that did, at great risk to their lives. Now, the theory of evolution, if you subscribe to it, I'm not, I'm not endorsing it at all, uh, is based on the notion that um, survival of the fittest, that, that uh, things evolve in order to maximize a survival advantage. Given the fact that morality in many cases is contra to a survival advantage, therefore it's, it would not be likely that it would be a product of evolution, but rather it was a God-given uh, force that God put into us because our souls are in the image of God. Our souls are the breath of God. Again, I'm not suggesting these things are, are, are fail-safe. I've got me right extensively the notion that the idea that God can be proved to a 100% certainty is simply overkill and oversell, and it should not even be said by people who are trying to help people come to God because when you oversell your product, uh, if I claim 100% certainty, and I can only prove it 98, you'll say, oh, oh, you see, the guy can't prove what he says. He only proved it 98%. So we're not dealing with certainties here. We're dealing with reasonable probabilities. And the case is clearly there for reasonable probability. And why God did not want to give us absolute certainty, the short answer would be because God wanted to create a world that facilitates free will and free choice. And if God's presence would be absolutely, positively, obvious, without any makom, to have any type of doubt, that would negate the free will and autonomy that Hashem wanted in the world. So by definition, part of this is going to be a mystery, but Hashem in His kindness did create a world where the probabilities are leaning strongly in the direction of that. Uh, yeah? The Rambam says that one can observe nature and uh, perceive God within it. Yeah. Something of that nature. Yes. And there's also a Mishnah that says if you stop learning to look at nature, it's a bad thing. So how, how do we understand yeah, that? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, the Rambam says, which, uh, which is really the, the source of the first point I made, that you can see God through nature. That's the look at the science of the world. And uh, from the complexity of the universe and the beauty of all the pieces coming together, you see the supreme intelligence of a creator, which indicates, and it really goes back to Tehillim, that looking at nature can bring one to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And yet we have the famous Mishnah in Pirkei Avos that says, if I stop my learning and I say, Ma noya ilon zeh, how beautiful is this tree? Harizeh mitzchayev b'nafshau, he deserves to die. How dare he contemplate the beauty of a tree in the middle of learning Gemara? So the question you're asking is, well, the Rambam says contemplating nature brings me to God. So what's wrong with contemplating nature? So I'll give, I'll give you two answers. Uh, answer number one is that it doesn't say, if Pirkei Abbas would have said, anyone who says how beautiful is the tree is Chai of Misa, you would have had a good kasha. But the Mishnah does not condemn looking at trees. The Mishnah condemns the guy who stops learning to look at the tree. In other words, there's a time and a place for your different avoda. When you're learning, you focus on learning. That's answer number one. But I'll give you answer number two, which I like a lot. It's a drish, but it's from the famous Kutzker Rebbe. He says, you know what the problem is? It says he stops his learning, meaning when he looks at the tree, he's not connecting it to his service of God. But if he would regard contemplation of the tree as part of his learning process, to feel and see the godless Hashem, then it would have been a good thing. Now, did you hear what he's saying? He's, he's treating it as an interruption in his avodah Hashem, when in fact it ought to be a continuation of his avodah Hashem. I'm not saying that that's the Pashat Pshat of the Mishnah, but it's a beautiful thought. Um, in fact, I, once, I heard from one of my rabbim in yeshiva many years ago. We were talking about, or actually I, I wasn't there, but uh, the shmooze that I was told about. He was talking about what is an ideal Torah vacation. If you have a choice between 
going to the Grand Canyon or going to amusement parks or whatever it is. So he was making the point that he held that nature is a more Torah dickification than man-made stuff. And he wasn't talking about Sneas even, he wasn't talking about all of that stuff. And he was basically saying, because if you regard vacation time as a time to build up your spirituality in maybe a different way than you do the whole year, then you should be connected to various phenomena that give you a greater sense of awe and reverence of HaKadosh Baruch So my feeling with the Grand Canyon or my feeling with uh, Niagara Falls even, you know, whatever it might be, is different than simply going to a man-made event where you're not necessarily seeing the godless Hashem. So you have to regard even your, your vacations, your tiyulim and Baruch Hashem, by the way, I don't know why I gave my, all my examples Schutzler, so we have beautiful, beautiful things to see in Eretz Israel too. They are of smaller scale, but like a diamond, you know, beautiful, beautiful parts of nature uh, that are here, that one should consciously think, Ma godlu masecha Hashem, how great is your creation, Hashem. Kulam b'chachma asisa, everything was made with divine wisdom. So that's the Katsuki Rebbe's point. Don't make it a break in your learning. Treat it as a continuation of your learning. Yeah. The beginning with the Baruch Hashem, the Ramchal, the Ramchal Mishata, it's incumbent upon every year to believe and to know the existence of Hashem. That, that knowing is implying there's no doubt. Well, again, the question is, uh, yeah, you're correct. Uh, there is a chiv to know, and, and, and basically the Ramchal is, is echoing the Rambam himself, the Rambam who says there's a mitzvah to know. The question is, uh, really, what do we mean by knowledge? Uh, is knowledge 100% certainty? Because a lot of things we know are based on probabilistic judgments of what is probable, what is logical, and therefore, what is most likely right? So I wouldn't be mochiach necessarily from Leda 100%. But I want to say another thing, though, about this. There is, and again, I'm not saying the Ramchal means this, but, Dafka, but, but he might. There, is, there are different levels of knowledge. There is a knowledge that is a cognitive knowledge, a knowledge of the mind. And the knowledge of the mind is what gets you committed in the first instance. Meaning, unless I'm convinced that God is a rational probability... Why should I go there? So what gets me started is the rational probability of a bore based on the different considerations that I've said. But you see, things don't end there. Because once you follow the derech of Torah, once you're doing mitzvahs, once you've made the commitment, there is a certain knowledge of the heart in which you can feel that something is right even though you can't prove it to 100%. And that intuitionist knowledge of the heart convinces, it can actually be more real to a person. So it could very well be that, you know, in fact, maybe, maybe, that's why we have the two Lashinas. The Lahamin, it's not blind faith, but Lahamin is to believe based on rational considerations. And through that commitment, you come to Leda you know it for sure. You're margish it for sure. So it could be Badafka Medoyak in the two Lashinas that the Ramchal does. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things in life that you really know are true, even though you can't automatically state it as a logical syllogism. I know some people say, well, intuitions are worthless, but uh, it's not necessarily so. Who you choose to marry can often not be reduced on a piece of paper, the pluses, the minuses. There is something beyond the, the rational that is involved with, with Avodah Hashem. Uh, they tell the story about um, three Jewish philosophy students in Germany who were examining the arguments for and against God. And they had all of these different questions, so they resolved that they would send one of their members to the world-famous Volusioner Yeshiva to learn Torah for a year, and then they would come back with all of the answers. 
So, I mean, they weren't, they weren't religious, they, but they sent one of their, their group to Volazhin. So the person went to Volazhin and he learned Torah for a whole year. He came back after the year, he was of course a very different person. And the two friends surrounded him and asked very eagerly, did you get answers to the questions? So he said, I have no answers, but I also have no questions. Interesting, meaning sometimes the answer to the question is, it stops being a question because in my heart, I know what's right. Um, so that might be a, a possible mahalach to this. The initial decision is made on rational basis, but then there's a momentum that Hashem gives you that takes you to a higher place. Uh, yeah? Are there any um, yeah. like specific study practices that you would recommend? Any what? Didn't you? Like learning practices? Learning practices uh, in terms of how to remember or just how to re well, concentrate? Like just general advice, general things, like patterns. Well, I, I don't have you know I don't have any any chidushim. I mean, obviously, review is a very very major issue. But but I will suggest this. I will suggest, and this I know by the way, not just from learning Torah. I know this as a law professor. I was a I was a teacher of secular studies too, and I, I'm aware of what what often hurts people in in learning anything. And that is, you get too involved in detail. Uh, of course, in Torah, every detail matters. But there's a real, real problem that, as the saying goes, you don't see the forest because of the trees. So even in Chazara sometimes, Chazara is not necessarily, you know, I'm going to review word by word by word by word by word, although you have to do that too. But Chazara is you want to know the big picture. What do I know from this sugya? Can I say, I learn a blot of Gemara. It says, what have I learned here? What do I know? You know, I know people that, you know, they, 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 they memorize the Gemara, and it's interesting. But you ask them a question, in other words, they say, I'll tell you, they tell you the whole Gemara, then they'll tell you the whole Rashi, and then they'll tell you the whole Tosfos. That's not knowing it. You only know it when you bring Rashi into the Gemara and you bring Tosfos into the Gemara. How does Tosfos learn that's not? You don't say, oh, there's the, there's the Rashi, the Gemara, and then there's the Rashi, and then there's the Tosfos. That's not knowing it. Knowing is integrating. Knowing is seeing the big picture. So I think that's very important in your Chazara that you sit back and say, what are the basic things that I know? And Mimela, by the way, what are the things I don't know? And you'll find that's going to be very helpful. That'll also give you a lot of chizak. Because often, when we learn a difficult sugya, we walk away with a brain fog. It says, I just don't know what's going on. I really don't know what's going on. I could say this, I could say that, I could say that. I don't really know what's going on. But you'd be surprised, and this is good, good news, you'd be surprised that there's quite a lot that you do know, and you're only confused about a very specific point. So if you spend the time to assess what do I know and what do I not know, even if you don't spend the time to get an answer to what you don't know, write it down in a notebook. I don't understand the second raya that Tosvo springs to the second answer that he gave to Akasha. Okay? Something I got to work on. But that doesn't mean you don't understand the Kasha and that doesn't mean you don't understand the Teretz. There's a certain detail. So one very important point in learning is don't leave sugyas with brain fog. That doesn't mean you've got to have an answer to everything. But know what you know and know what you don't know. And you'll actually find that you know, you, you know a bit more than you think you know. And if indeed you see you don't know anything, yeah, so they should, i got, I got to clarify this uh, in, some, in some way. Because the worst thing, and this is also psychologically very bad, is when a person just is confused. Because then, you know, you're, you're tzabrach and you're broken up, uh, you feel you're not accomplishing anything. Right? Know what you know. Know what you don't know. Uh, what did Donald Rumsfeld, who was the sec Secretary of Defense during America's war with Iraq, what did he once say? He once said, there's a lot of things we don't know, but sometimes we know what we don't know, and sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And he said, it's much better to know what you don't know 
than not to know what you don't know, right? And I would say, I would apply that to, to learning itself. Uh, yeah. In the road, will please explain what it is about the Eben Ezra's Pshat in Chumash that makes it somewhat controversial? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the Ramban, uh, Rav Avram Ibn Ezra, so he's not Ben Ezra, Ibn was the family name, uh, and uh, was one of the great, great commentaries on Chumash. In fact, even the Rambam was familiar with the Eben Ezra and made occasional uh, mention of him. Uh, and uh, the three classical, not the only ones, but the three classical perushim of the Rishonim on Chumash are, of course, Rashi, Ramban, and Eben Ezra. Those are the, the classical big three. And when the Ramban wrote his perush, the Ramban said he would address Rashi and Eben Ezra, but it's so interesting how he describes the difference. He says, I will address Rabbeinu Shlomo, that's Rashi, with kavod and honor and respect and reverence, even though the Ramban does argue with Rashi. And then with the Eben Ezra, he quotes a Pasuk in Mishle. He says, open, right, tochecha megula, open rebuke but hidden love, meaning I love the guy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rebuke him a lot. Right? Tochecha megula, ava musiteres. So what makes the Eben Ezra so, so controversial? Well, first of all, on one level, let me just point out that the Eben Ezra is what we would call a very pshat-oriented parish. Now, the truth is, Rashi also said he was a very pshat-oriented parish, but Lemaise with Rashi, it's much looser because Rashi brings so many midrashim. In fact, Rashi is largely, although there are many chidushim in Rashi, but Rashi is largely an anthology of Gemaros and Midrashim, selectively, with great chachma in the selection, uh, applying it to psukim and the like. And books have been written about what guided Rashi. If there's like 20 Midrashim on a Pasuk, what guided Rashi to choose one Midrash over the, and not say the other 19? Okay. The Eben Ezra does not use Chazal at all. The Eben Ezra was a great grammarian. He focuses on words. He focuses on diktuk. Now that itself is not bad, but here's the problem. Given the fact that he is so pshat-oriented, he will often interpret a pasuk, keneged chazal. Now, it's a little strange that, that he gets hit so much for this, because the truth is, even Rashi sometimes does it, and even Ramban does it even a little bit more than Rashi. So what the Eben Ezra is accused of by Ramban, uh, the Ramban himself is guilty of, but it's a matter of degree. The Eben Ezra does it all the time, even though the Eben Ezra says when it comes to halacha, we have to follow chazal, right? The Eben Ezra was never making the argument that we follow pshat, keneged, halacha, but he was saying there is pshut shel mikra. So one thing that makes him controversial, although as I say, he's not alone in this, is his uh, emphasis on pshat often meant he was ignoring the way Chazal interpreted the Pesukim. By the way, another person who had that same accusation was none other than Rashi's own grandson, the Rashbam, who wrote a Perish very much, very similar in many ways uh, to the Eben Ezra. And the Rashbam in Parshas Vayeshev, this is a fascinating little shtickle of the Rashbam, recounts a discussion he had with his grandfather, Rashi, in which he said to his grandfather, you know, you bring all these midrashim, you know, why don't you write a commentary that is based on the diktuk and the grammar and the syntax and pshuto shel mikra. And the Rashbam says that my grandfather told me, you know, you're right, if I had more time in my life, I would rewrite a whole new perish to incorporate al derech hapshat. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say this. I always had the feeling, maybe, okay. I mean, it's not respectful, but I was just thinking that, you know, Rashi wanted to get his anical off his back. The Rashi was bothering him too much about this. So he said, oh, you're right, you're right. You know, maybe I would write another, another parish. But Rashi was, I think, happy with what he did. And, of course, we are very happy with what Rashi did. Now, so that, that's the main thing. Now, there is another part of the Eben Ezra, which is still shrouded in mystery, which different people interpret in different ways. The Eben Ezra suggests in a few places, but he writes in hints, that's another thing. The Eben Ezra, in addition to being a grammarian, also liked riddles. So he would often say things in a hidden, mysterious, riddle way, which you know you could barely figure out and people are trying to figure out. 
in his riddles, there seems to be an intimation that he acknowledges the possibility that there are verses in the Torah that were added in future times after the death of Moshe Rabbeinu and even after Yoshua. Now, the Gemara tells us, that the Gemara at least gives us the possibility that the last eight verses were written by Yoshua ben Nun. Okay, that, that's a possibility, according to one man, the Yomar, even in the Gemara. But the Ebenezer suggests, you know, Anshay Knesset Sakdola, he suggests different editions, which don't change halacha. He, he says there were no mitzvahs that were changed, but certain narratives, because the reason is, for example, when, when the Torah says, uh, these are the kings who ruled over Edom before there was a king in Yisrael. Right? So the king of Yisrael is Shaul. So who wrote before there was a king, you know, before there was Shaul? That implies that was written after Shaul. Things like that. Now, as I say, whenever the Eben Ezra says those things, he says it in a very enigmatic, mysterious way where you're not, not, you're not really sure that he's actually saying it. But some have taken him to say that, in which case the Eben Ezra statement, according to the Rambam, would be kafira, <laughs> etc. So um, those are kind of the issues. Meaning, in some circles, Eben Ezra was regarded as being kafir in certain fundamentals of of Judaism. I will say, though, the following: um, Eben Ezra is quoted in at least one Tosvos and Shas that I know as actually asking. Rabbeinu Tam a Kasha. Interesting grammatical Kasha. Uh, and the, the, I'll tell you what the Kasha is, because it's a good grammatical Kasha. Uh, what is the meaning of the word Pesach in the Torah? Uh, is Pesach the day of the bringing of the Korban Pesach, which is the 14th of Nisan, or is Pesach the beginning of, like we say today, the beginning of the Yom Tov of Pesach, which is the 15th of Nisan? Right? When I say Pesach, I mean the 15th. Erev Pesach is the 14th. But when the Torah says Pesach, what does it mean? So the Eben Ezra asked Rabbeinu Tam, there is a stira in biblical usage. Because in Parshas Masai, when it describes the Jewish people leaving Mitzrayim, it says, they left Mitzrayim mimacharas ha-Pesach. The day after Pesach, they left Mitzrayim. Now, wait a second. What calendar day did they leave Mitzrayim? On the 15th of Nisan, which we call the first day of Pesach. So what do you mean they left Mitzrayim the day after Pesach? So says the Eben Ezra, it's Muchrach, that when the Torah says Pesach, it's the 14th of Nisan. Isn't it but, the Fairish? Huh? Isn't it the Fairish? The Torah says, Bar Basayon. No, Pesach no, 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 it's not the Fairish. No, it's not the Fairish. It just says, Mimachra, it's a Pesach. No, yes, it's earlier. It says, Bar Basayon, Pesach. Pesach. Well, well, yeah, but that's, that's Pesach. That, yeah, okay, that's Pesach as a Korban. But the question is, when you're referring to a, a Zman, a Zman, the, the Zman of Pesach, what, what Zman you're referring to. Now, the Eben Ezra had a stira. Because in Sefer Yehoshua, uh, it also says, Mimacharas Pesach, they ate the Chadash. Remember, you're not allowed to eat Chadash, the new grain, until the 16th of Nisan. 16th of Nisan. And that's called, in Yehoshua, Mimacharas Pesach, the day after Pesach. Which only makes sense if Pesach means the 15th. So the Ebenezer asked Rabbi Natan the question, and Rabbeinu Tam gave a bit of a dochic answer. He basically said, uh, Lashon Torah is different than Lashon Nevi'im. Meaning to say, the Torah uses Pesach to mean 14th. The Nevi'im, like us, like our usage today, when they say Pesach, they mean the Achilles Pesach, the day of eating the Pesach, which is the fruit of the 15th. So the reason I just brought this in is just to say that apparently if the Ibn Ezra had a shock of Atari with Rabbeinu Tam, apparently Rabbeinu Tam did not consider him a kaifer or not be tyrus, but th these were some of the, the controversies uh, with the evidence. Yeah. Just, how does a Pirish operate outside of Chazal? How, you, how does that work? Well, once again, the truth of the matter is, even Ramban and even Rashi, to the, to the lesser degree of that, uh, they do this because it was Vadai Makobal among the Rishinim. 
And you can find Beferis statements in many Rishayim that when it comes to explaining Pshuto Shal Mikra, we are not bound by Chazal as long as it is not Nogeya, the practicalities of Halacha. Uh, this is a statement, again, I, I, I don't have all the documentation off the top of my head, but this was a Mahalich in Rishayim all along, and in truth, it was even continued into the modern era. Uh, the Nitziv, for example, who very, very often will explain Pesukim according to Chazal, will occasionally not, because he says there's Pshuto Shal Mikra, and Ein Mikra Yosim Bidei Pshuto, meaning a Pasuk is never excluded from the Pasuk Pshat, means there are multiple levels of interpretation, and the level of Pshat is still going to be a valid level uh, of, of interpretation. So this was Makobo, that on matters which were not halachic matters, uh, Chazal didn't have, because remember, okay, this gets us, you know, everything opens up into another issue. Uh, things like Midrashim, interpretations of Psukim, these were not necessarily part of a Tarish of Balpeh that Hashem gave Moshe. If that would be the case, we really couldn't argue with it. But these are the Chachamim looking at Psukim and extracting different meanings. And therefore, they were not necessarily part of the inviolate Tarish of Balpeh, except insofar as they pertain to halacha, where the Torah gives the chachamim the koach to be koveya halacha. Yeah. Can Rebbe explain the two concepts of shivim coming the Torah and ilu ve'ilu ve'ilu Yeah, so these are two phrases that Chazal use. One is shivim panim la Torah. There are 70 faces to the Torah. Uh, the other is ilu ve'ilu ve'ilu kim chayim. Uh, when you have a machlokas, even if they go in opposite directions, one says kosher, one says strafe, you know who's right? It says, both of them, they and those, are the words of, of, of Hashem. Now, if you're asking me, can I uh, sharply differentiate, uh, I'm not sure that I can. I would just say, I think Elo Elo Dibre Elo Kim Chaim is more radical. See, Shivim Panim Latorah just means there are many ways of understanding things, but in many of those cases, they're not contradictory. The Chiddush of Elu V'Elu Divrei Elu Kim Chayim, that's going further, is saying, even if they're contradictory, Chayav, Pater, Kosher, Treif, Tamei Tor, they're both true there too. So I would say Elu V'Elu is a Chiddush that maybe is being Moisif on Shiv and Panam Latayra. Uh, but the basic idea is really explained by the Ran. And the Ran says something, in the, remember the Ran we know as the great Mefaresh on the Rif, and uh, also he wrote Chidushe Aran on many Mesechtas, but he also wrote a very beautiful book, it's even been translated in English, on philosophical problems in the Chumash. This is the sefer called Drushos Haran. That's the same Ran who wrote all of the Chidushim. And Drushos Haran is a beautiful, beautiful sefer that uh, you, know, you should look at. It. There's an art scroll translation, some other translations on it now as well. And one of the themes he goes into is, how is it shayach elu v'elu? Meaning, when God gave Moshe the Torah Shabal Peh to explain Psukim, God gave him, God said kosher or treif, chayav or pater, tame or tohar. God didn't say both things, they're contradictory. So if somebody comes up, if two, if two great rabbis or two great gedolim come up with opposite positions, how could they both be blessed with the imprimatur of divine truth, since one of them must have been what Hashem didn't say? So the Ran says a very radical, interesting idea, and he says, you know, we misunderstand Torah Shabal Peh if we think that Hashem gave Moshe the answer to every possible question that will ever come up. Rather, Torah Shabbat Peh meant Hashem gave Moshe general, other than Halacha Moshe Misina, which are specific rulings, but generally he gave him a methodology. He gave him foundational principles. And it's left to the Chachamim in every generation to apply those principles to the new things that occur in life. The Torah is eternal. But life is ever-changing. So, I mean, let, let me give you a simple example like this. Let's imagine, you know, electricity was harnessed, I don't know, 
1870, whenever it was. So there was an immediate question, is electricity considered fire? The old-fashioned incandescent, I don't mean LED and all the uh, you know, modern stuff, um, is an incandescent light bulb considered to be fire on Shabbos? So what does a POSIC look at? A POSIC looks at, well, I look at the sources, I look at the precedents, I look at analogies. But a POSIC might say, what I'm really trying to figure out is, what did God say to Moshe about electricity? But since I have no direct way of knowing that, I'm trying to reconstruct what God probably said. That's how a person might describe the halachic process. You know what the Ran would say? The Ran would say, that's totally wrong. What did God say to Moshe about electricity? He said nothing at all. Nothing at all. But he gave Moshe information from which conclusions could be drawn. So therefore the Ran says, if you have people who are authorized to be Chachamim, that's a huge question by the way, but people who qualify as Chachamim, and they are following the rules and utilizing the principles. God basically said, whatever they come up with is going to be okay. So, Eilu v'Eilu Dimrei Kim Chaim doesn't mean that God said yes and no, but yes and no becomes the will of God because it was dis discovered through the process of halachic decision-making. In other words, one way of saying it is, Instead of looking at Torah Shabal Peh as the word of God, Torah Shabal Peh is the will of God. This is God's will as to how halacha can, uh, should be established. So Elu V'Elu, says the Ran, is based on Hashem saying that as long as the process is followed by those who are authorized, again, those are big, both of them are very big questions, but I'm not defining that for now, Hashem says, I will regard the conclusion as my will. My will can exist in contradictory ways. They tell a story about the Shagasari. This is a fascinating story, how God's will will respond to the Psak. The Shagasari, one of the great, great Gedoli Achrayim, was actually a Rav in Volazhin. He was the Rav of Rav Chaim of Volazhiner's parents. Uh, and uh, the story goes that there are laws of trephos, right? If animals have certain internal defects, they're not kosher even if they're shechted. So apparently the Shagas Ari had a certain leniency in the laws of trephos that no other Rav in Europe had. And he had paskin that in Vulajan you could eat an animal with a certain defect that was trefa everywhere else. There was a man who had the problem in his lung that was exactly this particular defect and he wanted to go to a drier climate for his health. The Shakir Sari advised him, you better not leave Volazhin. Because the Gemara says, anything that's a trefa can only live for 12 months. So in Volazhin, the Ratzon Hashem is, you're not a trefa, so you'll live. Once you leave Volazhin, you're going to be subject to the psak of the other Chachamim, that you're a trefa, you're not gonna live more than a year. So it's better for you to stay in the bad climate in Volazhin than to try to leave the city. So the guy didn't understand this. He thought this was ridiculous. Uh, he, he just left, and indeed the mice goes, you know, he died within a year. Because the Ratsa in Hashem is Nishtana based on the Psak that's going to be going to be applied. Yeah. Has there ever been and should there be an effort to sort of like unify Ashkenazi and Sephardim and Hagim and Halakha and like one Uniform. Yeah, interesting question. Uh, people say, you know, why so many Minagam, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and within Ashkenazim, we have Litvisha, and we have Yeki, and Hungarian, and Sephardim are uh, Tunisian, and Morocco, and Taimoni, which is technically not Sephard, but, but you know, close to Sephardim and the like. Shouldn't we be one nation? Shouldn't we have Achtos, especially now in Eretz Israel? We're no longer living in all of these diaspora countries. One country, let us have a Nusach Achid a unified Nusach. So your idea indeed is floated by uh, different Rabban and we said, you know, we're, we're in our country. Uh, there should be one Am Yisrael. But the Emma says, I think that's not true. Because let's go back to the paradigm of the tribes. You know, there are 12 Shvatim. Now, even though today we don't have a tribal 
you know, most of us, we don't know our tribe unless you're a Cohen or a Levy. So I, 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 you know, I don't think of myself as I'm from Binyamin or I'm from Yisachar. We don't even know. But tribes were a big deal in the Torah. Separate land, separate nasi, separate flag, separate encampment. In fact, you see from the book of Shoftim that the Shvatim actually regarded their territories as almost sovereign countries. It's almost as if there were t- uh, 12 countries, nations, which had a common religion. So you may wonder, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu create an Am Yisrael in which tribal affiliation would be important? Isn't the only thing important that we're Jews? Right? We need another cause of this unity. And the answer is HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted there to exist within the framework of Am Yisrael a diversity of approaches, different ways of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Each shevet had its unique function. Today we don't work through Shvatim, but we do work that way through Minhagim. Uh, Yekis, Ashkenazim, Sephardim, Taimanim, uh, Litvak, whatever it would be. There's a beauty in the fact. Now, it turns bad when it turns into machlokas and name calling and denigration. That's bad. But in terms of maintaining all of the unique and distinct Minhagim, that is a matter of beauty. Uh, there's a medrash in Bamidbar that says a garden is more beautiful if there are different colored flowers. You can have a garden of 10,000 red roses, which has a certain beauty, but for most people, the colors are part of the beauty. And uh, that's why some say that even when Mashiach comes, even when Mashiach comes, we will still have Ashkenazim and Sephardim, because that's the Ratzon Hashem, that there should be different ways. You know, during World War II, when uh, the number of yeshivas had to be moved, relocated, to Shanghai, uh, etc. So obviously that, 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 that entailed a huge financial commitment to relocate people, move people, reestablish. So Mir was the big yeshiva. Mir had several hundred people, but there were a lot of small yeshivas, 10 people here, 10 people here. So someone went to Rav Chaim Meiser, who was kind of in charge of the move, and he said, you know, why don't we just consolidate all of these little yeshivas, make them part of a big yeshiva, and then we have economies of scale. Food will be cheaper, transportation will be cheaper, all of these things. And Rav Chaim Oyser was against it. He said that we need to preserve even the small institutions that have their own idiosyncratic minhagim because they contribute to the beauty of Am Yisrael. So I, I do agree with you that sometimes the factionalization can be a source of machlokas, and particularly Sephardim historically in Eretz Yisrael, uh, have been dis- they've suffered a lot of discrimination from the Ashkenazim. Uh, to this day, it's so fascinating. I mean, I mean, it's laughable, but it's very, very sad that you'll find uh, some Svardim to get their kids into a good cheder, they change their name to Goldberg. Mm-hmm. Because if the, uh, if the uh, Vad sees or the Menial sees a Svardic name, they'll just reject the kid from the, uh, from the cheder. So now the... Uh, there was, this happened so many times, they now ask on the application, list all names you have had, like criminal check, list all <laughs> names you have had over the past five years. And assuming the person won't lie, they're going you know, to yeah. know what the person's name is. So that's very unfortunate. That, that's really, really very bad. But when, when you can do it without machlokas, it actually contributes to the beauty of Am Yisrael. Yeah? So what are some factors that when choosing a community to live in, one should take into account, and maybe specifically in Eretz Yisrael, that is different from other places in the world. Yeah, so once again, I'm going to say something that I'll get in trouble, and, and many people will disagree. I will tell you right off the bat, many people will disagree, many Hushaba people will disagree with me, so uh, I'm just going to tell you what I would, what I would look for. Now, the automatic answer that most people will tell you, most you know, religious people will tell you, is you have to look for the most religious, most observant community, and then you have to define it. If you're Haredi, it has to be Haredi. Uh, don't have other types of Jews there. Don't have secular Jews. Uh, try to avoid Dati Liumi, you know, even, uh, and the like, because you need to have the starkest community that you can have, the most homogenous community you can have. Lani Estaiti, although I recognize the strength of that, I recognize the strength of having a strong, unified community, I think people benefit, children benefit a lot from seeing different types of Jews. Different types of religious Jews, for sure. 
Ashkenazim Sephardim, as I just said, but I will even say, although this I may get criticized for, even be in contact with non-religious Jews. To understand there's a Klal Yisrael, to understand there are different types of people, to learn how to treat everybody with respect, and, and to be a shtickle ambassador, you know, of Kiddush Hashem, to kind of show other people that, you know, we're not monsters or, or whatever it is. And I think that gives kids, number one, a greater Avas Yisrael, and number two, it gives them a greater uh, ability to relate to different types of people. And now again, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of ph philosophy follows autobiography, meaning to say, oh, we, we tend to develop our intellectual ideas based on our life experiences. So I've mentioned a number of times, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, which had a very small Orthodox community, and although Baruch Hashem, my parents, Aleya Mashalom, sent me to a Jewish school, which was an Orthodox day school. But in those days, there was no Salman Shechter, so the majority, 70 to 80 percent of my classmates, were Mechalolei Shabbos. And it was also a co-ed school. So somebody would look at a co-ed school where most of the students are Mechalolei Shabbos, and one would say, I wouldn't send my kid to that school in a million years. What type of crazy? Of course, there was no alternative, but the mice said, you know, how could you possibly think of that? But, in retrospect, look back, we learned to get along, we learned to respect each other, we learned to like each other. And I think that pays dividends later in the ability to be Makarev people, to be Machanich people. So, now I didn't yet answer your question. In other words, I just said what wouldn't, in other words, getting the frumest, most Haredi community is not necessarily the, the one thing that you look for. I think a certain amount of heterogeneity and mix is a good thing. But what you do want to look for is you do want to look for a community of shalom, of midos tovos, of people who get along, of people who are not overly politicized, an atmosphere of shalom. The last Mishnah, you know, Baruch Hashem, you remember we, the yeshiva just made a siyam, the zecher uh, Rav Rachmel, zechreinu levracha. So uh, I read the last Mishnah in Uktsin. Hashem could not find a vessel that contains blessing other than interpersonal peace. Shalom doesn't just mean lack of war with the Arabs, although it includes that too. It refers to the shalom among Jews. So I would actually say the number one thing you're looking for is shalom. Now, now, of course, there has to be a basic, you know, from stru orthodox structure. But in Eretz Israel, you can go anywhere, you'll have a basic structure. I mean, you need a shul, you need a mikvah, you know, you need a source of kosher food, you need a good Erev. But that you'll find, you know, in 85% you know, of, of uh, any place in Eretz Israel will have a basic infrastructure. But the notion that I have to have the most Haredi neighborhood possible you know, I get Shiloh sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you see, um, somebody didn't want to move to Arzea Bira, which, as far as I know, it's a pretty religious place, uh, because uh, he saw these girls riding bicycles. So I can't, I can't live in a neighborhood where a girl rides a bicycle. You know, on the list of things to look for, I, I don't put that very high in particular. And I think we're looking for external chitzenius, and we're not looking at Midos and Shalom, which are the most important thing. Okay, so that's kind of my brief answer. Again, uh, people will disagree with me, and, and I'm, not, I'm not disparaging that, because there is a counter, there's always a counter argument. The counter argument is, hey, I don't want my children to be subjected to negative influences and the like from non-religious Jews. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's an issue to consider. But overall, I think that the benefits outweigh the chesreinus. Yeah. We mentioned this week a uh, certain rabbi who made a forgery of a Yeah, you shall me, yeah. Is there more information about the aftermath or the motivations of this rabbi once it was discovered? Yeah, yeah, just again, I don't want to go over the whole story. I mentioned a few days ago that um, there was a rabbi who actually claimed to have discovered a long lost. Talmud Yerushalmi and Maseches Chulun and Bechores. Imagine discovering a Gemara. 
and he actually printed it, and he put in a, he wrote a Rashi commentary, which was his own commentary, and a Tosfos commentary. Again, those were his own, and he said they were his own. But it turned out the whole thing was, the Gemara was a forgery. He made up a Gemara and then wrote some great commentaries on it. Uh, now, the guy must have been a genius and a phenomenal Talmud Chacham. I mean, I, I, I absolutely couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do a Bavli, and I certainly couldn't do a Yerushalmi, you know, and get away with it, because there were Gedolim who were Moskim. <laughs> it was so convincing. So the person had tremendous Torah knowledge, and was an, he must have, must have been an Eloi. So what's going on? What motivates a person just to forge a Gemara? I mean, you don't even get covered from it, because the, the whole thing is based on keeping it secret. I mean, you can't even say, hey, look what I... Although the Maitre, they say, he was discovered because he did tell somebody he couldn't hold it in. But certainly his plan was to keep it secret. So what's the motivation? I, I don't know. I can't figure it out. Maybe it's just an internal challenge. I want to see if I can do it. Like when they say that uh, Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. Someone asked him, why'd you do it? He says, because it's there. <laughs> it's a challenge. So this is like a challenge. Can I forge a Gemara? You know, I mean, listen, the next challenge would be, I'm going to forge a, the sixth book of the Chumash. You know, you know, he, could have, he could have gone one, one better. That he did not. You know, he, didn't, he didn't do. So I don't know. It's, it's really taka a mystery. It's a mystery about what motivated the person. I'm sure um, a psychologist could have some fascinating insights. Why do people do these things? By the way, uh, well, let me give you another example, which is actually not as egregious. Um, there is a Sefer, Shelo Suchuvos, B'Samim Rosh. B'Samim Rosh. B'Samim Rosh was published in the 1700s by a Rav whose name was Rav Shaul Berlin. Now, the B'Samim Rosh, at the time it was published, was extremely important because he claimed it was lost chuvos of the rush. The rush is one of the greatest postkim of the Rishonim. We have, in fact, chuvos of rush. He claimed these are totally new chuvos of the rush that nobody ever knew. Well, for a while, that made Besamim Rosh one of the most important chuvos. Uh, what did the rush say? Right? The rush Paskins, the rush was the Yisod of the Torah. The Torah was the rush's son, etc. It turned out that Besamim Rosh was also a forgery. Shaul Berlin wrote all of the tshuvas. We'll call this reverse plagiarism, right? Plagiarism is when I take your stuff and I say it's from me. Reverse plagiarism is I take my stuff and I say it's from somebody more authoritative and, and the like. So that immediately created a very interesting halachic dilemma. Is the Besamim Rosh a legitimate source of halacha? Or is it like, you know, garnished, garnished mit garnished? Now, let me point out, there's a very big difference between the forged Yerushalmi. The forged Yerushalmi made up statements. Reish Lokish says this, Rav Yochanan says, they didn't say it. So the Yerushalmi on Kachim is worthless as a source of halacha. But the Besamim Rosh is a more complicated case because the Besamim Rosh uses Gemara's and, you know, Rashi, and, you know, Rambam, the Besamim Rosh uses legitimate halachic sources to construct arguments. The only thing is, he misattributes the, the, uh, the author by claiming it was the Rosh. So as a result, I think Ravaji Yosef took the position that we're not going to give the Besamim Rosh the authority of a Chuvos Harash, of course, We'll look at it as the chuvos of Rav Shaul Berlin, which oh, Rav Adji looked at all Shailos chuvos. So we'll look at it, we'll evaluate it, and if he's right, he's right. If he's wrong, he's wrong. So Rav Avadja continued to maintain, and he noted in the footnote that it's a ziyuf, but he continued to maintain it was a legitimate sefer of halacha, unlike the Yerushalmi and Kachu. There are other poskim who feel, hey, you know, what, what, the, the guy was dishonest. The guy cheated. The guy lied. So the whole Torah becomes puzzle because it didn't come through a proper way. But fascinatingly enough, there is one Gemara, again, I have to remember where it is, where the Gemara 
gives the story of somebody who did this, a very chash of the said something in the name of an Adam Gadol, and that Adam Gadol didn't say it, but the Amora credited in the name of Adam Gadol because he wanted his din to be makubal. He was so sure that his din was correct, but people wouldn't accept it if it's from him. So the Tzvarish Israel actually says, you're allowed to lie. Meaning, if I'm sure that the halacha is so-and-so, but you're not going to accept it from me, I'm allowed to say, Rav Moshe Feinstein Paskin this way. Even if he didn't. Because that's the way I get my Torah accepted. So based on that Gemara, which is a little enigmatic, uh, Shaul Berlin may have had a basis for what he did, because he wanted his words to be makubal. They wouldn't have been makubal had it just been, had it just been him. So I, I think the point I'm making is that the Besamim Rosh episode, or Besamim Rosh episode and the Yerushalmi and Kachim episode are really two different things. And I think it's easier to explain Shaul Berlin's reverse plagiarism than it would be to explain Mamish, a made-up Gemara, which is just just an act of imagination. Yeah. Um, as Rob, um any uh, shift in like, from, uh, the road. Well, uh, yeah, number one, I think um, the limud of, of Bikias has gotten better, meaning to say, uh, in my day a long time ago, the whole day was kind of like uh, an eon type of thing, so people didn't cover as much ground. In a positive way, I think people do cover more ground today, but Lamaisa is still not great uh, because... Rav Shach wrote about this like a hundred times. Uh, we have these extremes. We have the Ian Seder that goes very, very, very slow. And then we have the Bikia Seder that goes very, very, very fast. So one is you're fetching indefinitely uh, without getting anywhere. And the other is you're davening. By the way, it's so, it's so hurtful that we, whenever we talk about superficial speed, we say daven. I mean, it's an expression, right? I just used it. Think to myself, oh, that's what davening is, right? Daven up something, right? That's how we explain it. I mean, that's, that's a chaval, but okay. Um, on myself, but okay. Uh, but we go through it very quickly, superficial. Rav Shach said the ideal derech of Torah learning is you try to really understand everything you're doing, but you go at a reasonable pace. You don't overly ma'ayin in every commentary, and you don't go through the things very quickly and superficially. There should be like one derech of limut where you, you know, you don't learn a lot of rishonim, you don't learn a lot of mefarshim, but you focus on understanding pshat, and you go through shas that way. So today, I think Bikias has uh, has improved in many many ways, but we still have that uh, that problem. In terms of the 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 derech of Ian, has it changed? <coughs> I, I don't know. I, I think in Eretz Yisrael, the Derech Avian is different than Chutz Loritz anyway. So there's an Eretz Yisrael Chutz Loritz change. But I think within Eretz Yisrael or within Chutz Loritz, I don't think there's been major, uh, major changes. But I will tell you, Rav Cheskel of Ramsky, who was a great Zagadol, he was a, a, one of the Talmidim Mufakim of Rav Chaim Salavechik, and he was the uh, Av Basin of London, and then he came to Eretz Yisrael for the last decades of his life. A great, great guy. Although uh, by the time he came to Eretz Yisrael, he was not an active Rosh Yeshiva then. But he would give uh, occasional shiurim in all the yeshivas. He once walked by an avreich who had a table that was piled with ten svarim. Rebbe Kiveger, Ketzos, Nesivas, all, all the different svarim. So we asked the avreich, did you look at all of these svarim during your morning seder? So the Avrech said, yes, I went to all of the, t- I went through 10 achronim. He said, if you would have chazered the Gemara 10 times, it would have been a lot better. The Chazanish remarked that we misunderstand Ian. The Chazanish says, looking at a lot of Svarim is Bikias in Svarim. That's not Ian. Ian is when you think about something. Now, what do they say? Rashi learned Gemara without Taisus. Right? Mm-hmm. What did Rashi learn? Right? Oh, Rashi just, Rashi didn't look at Mephorshim. Ay, ay, ay. So superficial. 
right? <laughs> what, I mean, I mean, there was, there was no, right? So what do you do? So the essence of Ian, the Chazanish said, is thinking things through. And then you look at Svarim to help you in that. See, it's, very, it's, it's a very different process. You'll see this. If you try to learn a Gemara a number of times and try to think, do I understand the connection between A and B? Do I know how you get from here to here? And then you think about different possibilities. Well, maybe it's this way. Or maybe it's this way. And then you take a Rashba or a Ritva. It's going to be a very diff different experience. Then you're going to say, ah, now I know what he's saying. Now I know what he's doing. Now I know where he's coming from. Because I had the same kasha. Or even a Marsha is that way. So our problem is we, we go to the Svarim without thinking through the process. So we don't really, we don't really get what they're, what they're getting at even. You know, they say that, they say that, they say that. So Ian, true Ian, is to think about what you're learning. Look at the Gemara. And, that, and that's what, that's what Ibn Chesel Abramki is saying. Learn the Gemara ten times. And you'll come up with kashas, and you'll come up with answers, and you'll come up with possibilities, and then do a little looking in Svarim, and you'll actually find how much they're going to help you. Uh, yeah? Somebody who uh, comes to Torah later in life, uh, didn't have a shiva back then, already married and his children and whatnot, uh, what should he focus on for his Torah learning? You know, See, I, got, I didn't hear. What is he what? What should he focus on for his Torah learning? He's not going to be going to learn a shiva now and study. He doesn't even know how to learn tomorrow. Like, yeah, so good. I'll tell you the truth. Ideally, if you have the time and the strength, um, one should spend a lot of time learning Chumash with Rashi, actually all of Nach, but let's say Chumash with Rashi, and a lot of Mishnayas. Because you need to build a foundation. Everybody, everybody needs to build a big foundation. Uh, if you, I mean, let, let's take a simple example. If I learn Rashi, Parshas Mishpatim, with Rashi, and let me even add the Ramban, right? Rashi and Ramban, I learned Parshas Mishpatim, or I learned Parshas Kiseitse. Do you know how much of Bavakama and Bava Metziah, not too much Bava Basra, but Bava Kama, Bava Metziah, I would know if I really, really learned uh, the Rashi and the Pesukim very, very well. It would be a different experience, you know? So there's a lot you can gain by learning Chumash and Rashi, and especially if you had the Ramban, of course, but even, even without the Ramban, and learning a lot of Mishnayas. So I would actually recommend if a person is able to do this, that you give yourself a year in which all I'm going to learn is Chumash and Mishnayas. And I'm going to build myself up, and then when I go to Gemara, it's going to be a different type of experience. Now, in addition, in addition, you need to make some room for Halacha Lemaisa, because you need to know Halacha Lemaisa. But here is the thing. Your need to know Halacha Lemaisa is a practical need. I'm not advocating... Words, this gets us into another point of controversy. Okay, I want to learn Halacha Lemaisa. Does that mean I should learn Mishnah Brewer? Maybe not. Mishnah Brewer is a magnificent safer. Mishnah Brewer is a beautiful safer, especially the Bear Halacha. You see the Chafetz Chaim's greatness and guidance. But you know, if I need to know, you know, what type of refrigerator I can use on Shabbos, Mishnah Burr is not going to be that helpful for you. Mishnah Burr doesn't talk about electricity. He doesn't talk about any modern technology issue. So, if I'm learning Masechah Shabbos, Be'ion, by all means, the Mishnah Burr should be right next to my Gemara, and I should be looking at the Mishnah Burr and the Bar Halacha all the time. But if that's not my Yikr Liman, and I'm doing Halacha Lamaisa for practical reasons, I would not say the Mishnah Burr is the best book to learn. I would actually say, get an art scroll book in English and look at that. Because, in other words, there are two different reasons why you learn Halacha. One is, I want to understand the Halacha. So that requires Rish Gemara, Rishonim, Achronim, Mishnah Burr, for sure. But if it's a question I just want to know what to do in my house, when there's a power out, and you know, can I eat the chones when the power goes back in? You're actually better with quick guides that can give you practical information. So I would say chomish, mishnayas, quick guides, 
in halacha lamaisa, and make a little bit of time for some type of musr that, that appeals to you, you know, even 10 or 15 minutes a day, so you'll have a sense of your hashkafa in life and your direction in life. Okay, so I'm actually de-emphasizing Gemara, at least on a temporary basis, because I think people need a foundation. And with that foundation, their whole Gemara study will be in a different, different madrega. Now, you may ask me, so why don't we do that in yeshiva here? I just said something that we don't do. The short answer is this. When you're in yeshiva, you're often only here for a limited amount of time. If you were to tell me right now, you're here for 10 years, I might very well say for the first year, do exactly what I just said. Let's not learn Gemara for a year. But if you're only going to be here for a year, we got to give you a lot of Gemara. Because Gemara is a skill that's very hard to pick up unless you're in a full-time environment. So as a result, we got to kind of jumpstart you on Gemara before maybe we should. Because otherwise, you're never going to get the proficiency. But ain't a chinami. If you were here for the long haul, I might very well say, let's do a graduated approach. So once you're not in yeshiva, and, and you're, you're the balabayas in charge of your learning schedule, you might think of doing that. It's not heretical. Yeah. So, Rebbe mentioned that Havana and Tzfila is something that we can all focus on. I was wondering what maybe are some of the elements that, that can help that, and, or Sfarim, or any other elements that would help that. Yeah, so, you know, um, Rav Volba says a very interesting thing about, about this. Rav Volba says, you know, Baruch Hashem, there are many, many Meforshim on the Siddur, actually. And people think, oh, I want to learn all these Meforshim on the Tefillah, and that's going to give me Kavana. Rav Volba says, sometimes that hurts Kavana. Because, you know, you say a word, and you think, oh, this Rishon says this, and this says this. He says, that's like learning. But kavana is something that's much more connected to emotion and feeling. And therefore, sometimes you need to connect to the pashit pshat of the words, feeling that you're talking to Hashem. Now, there may be, you know, you have to look around, there may be a given single parish that appeals to you on that level. But it wouldn't be like, I want to learn all the mephorshim on a tefillah. Revolva suggests that that may be counterproductive in terms of kavana. You take a parish, so one example that many people tell me, although I, I talk, I have not even used it, but many people tell me they like it a lot, is Rav Shraub. If Shemit Shraub, Zichron Levracha, has a commentary on the Siddur that many say is very, very beautiful and that they use. You know, look at it and see if it, if it speaks to you. So one thing is concentrate on the words. The other is prepare yourself before you dive. And the Mishnah says in Brachas, that the Hasidim or Rishayim, the early pious people, would actually, uh, they, they would spend an hour of preparation before tefillah. That would mean nine hours a day, an hour afterwards, uh, three hours per tefillah. We don't have that time today, for whatever the reason. But even if you prepare yourself for five minutes, don't just rush in and start davening. Come a little early, think about your words, think about the fact that you're about to talk to HaKadosh Baruch he wants to hear from you. And regard the tefillah, as the Kuzari says, as the food of the neshama. And the Kuzari actually writes that tefillah should be the happiest part of the day, the joyous part, the most joyous part of the day, not something you want to get over with to go on to something else, even learning. Now that's a mindset, but it takes a certain amount of calming yourself. In fact, uh, words like mindfulness and meditation actually fit, fit in this context, if you're familiar with mindfulness. You want to quiet the mind. You want to sit. You want to think a little bit in a, a relaxed way so you'll be able to focus and feel that you're talking to Hashem. So this does require a little advanced preparation. Uh, yeah? I noticed uh, many people um, use the electricity here on Shabbos. What are they hearing and what are they assuming about? Yeah, well, this is uh, an old issue that's been around uh, for, you know, forever and ever in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, and that is, in Chutz Laaretz, you know, most of the people who work in the power companies are not Jewish, so I can benefit from what they're doing. In Eretz Yisrael, the people who, who work in the power companies are mainly Jewish. They are generating electric power in violation of Shabbos. Generally speaking, if a Jew violates Shabbos, you're not supposed to benefit 
from what he did on Shabbos in various ways. So as a result, there are those who took the position, which is a very logical position, that I'm not allowed to benefit from the chashmal on Shabbos because it was generated by Chilol Shabbos. This position is famously identified with the Chazen Ish, and as a result, you have to have your own generators, or buildings have to have their own generators, and they're not on the grid. They do not use the uh, national chashmal. Now, originally, this was a Bnei Brak minhag. Uh, it's interesting, the influence of Bnei Brak on Yerushalayim has actually gotten stronger and stronger in time, because the classic minhag Yerushalayim was to be mekel, and the reason they were mekel is that since the electricity is needed for hospital patients and pikuach nefesh situations, and you can't separate it, right? They can't just do the electricity for the hospitals, so therefore it becomes a pool of heter, and therefore the Israel is allowed to be nana. And this was the heter in Yerushalayim, Makobul uh, Yishlam, for many, many, many years. Uh, there were some poskim that indeed felt to be machmer, but the minute was to be mako. But in recent years, more and more B'nai Torah are following the Chazanish's Psak in B'nai Brak. Now the Chazanish said another reason. Besides the Yisra of being Nana from Chilol Shabbos, he says it's a Chilol Hashem that you're getting pleasure from a Jew desecrating Shabbos. He gave an example. The Chazanish said, <laughs> it's a striking example, he who benefits from electricity that Yidin desecrate on Shabbos is like a guy walking by a burning Beis HaMikdash. While it's burning, and he lights his cigarette by the fire. He says, oh, hey, it's a fire, listen, it's burning anyway, I'm not causing a fire, so I might as well light my cigarette. What type of Yid would have so little feeling for the Beis HaMikdash that he would use the fire of the burning to light a cigarette? The Chazanu says, what type of Yid doesn't feel pain over the desecration of Shabbos? that he could just enjoy the fruits of Jews who are desecrating Shabbos. So that's, that's the basis of the Machlokin. Yeah, last question. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me just, you didn't ask anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll get to you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. What, uh, what are the halakhic implications of, like, mesh tzitzit? So, mesh, yeah. What are the halakhic implications of the mesh uh, tzitzit? So uh, there, there are two, two implications. One implication is that with Derek Klau, there's always a preference for wool scissors because according to some opinions, uh, linen or any other, f or rayon or certainly artificial fabrics are not high in scissors de rice at all. And if that's so, you're not doing an aver, but you're also not doing a mitzvah. So one problem with mesh is simply that it's not wool. The other problem uh, is that um, since the openings are actually more than the closures. So a uh, halacha, halacha might treat it like a totally open garment, and therefore it's not, it doesn't have a shame beged. In order to be a beged, you have to have more filled area than empty space. So these are the questions. On the other hand, uh, Meikara did, it seems to be OK, but this is why some people don't like it. OK, uh, one more question, then we'll stop. Yeah. Uh, Rebbe mentioned earlier by Heter Mechir that sometimes Eating by a relative for shalom, there are certain hair. Yeah. How does maybe, let's say, if someone holds a certain kashrus, but the relative holds a different kashrus? Yes, yeah, so happens. it's impossible to answer this question without knowing very, very specific things. Now, it is true that sometimes people who, who want to only go with certain mahadra and ashkachos are just being machmer because they want to be machmer, and there too we could compromise for shalom bias. It's absolutely the case. Other times, however, there may be serious concerns. So, so in, in other words, if I hold to a certain standard and I don't hold to that other standard, there may be two reasons. One is, stamaza, I just want to be pious. The other is, I am specifically aware of shilas binogeya that heksher. So if I am aware of shilas, that's uh, something you, you, it's, you know, it's less permissible to compromise on. But if it's the general chumras, I, I, I mean, anything I say, I'm going to get in big trouble here. I mean, let, let me give you a specific, okay, I'm going to mention names, so I'll mention names. Uh, Bet Yosef, there are a lot of people that, uh, Ashkenazim, who don't use Bet Yosef. Okay? I'm going to plead the fifth. Whether I use it, I'm not going to say. But, uh, 
So people call me up and say, oh, um, there's some salmon under Bet Yosef, Hashgacha. I don't use Bet Yosef. Can I buy Bet Yosef salmon? You know, that's a ridiculous question. I mean, what, what, what Bet Yosef is going to serve, give you, give you trafe salmon? <laughs> what, what, is tra what is trafe salmon anyway? You know, so you might raise questions. I don't like their shechita. I don't like uh, what they do with chickens. Uh, Svardim, Ashkenazim. Okay, Th those are things you might raise. But on something like, but I don't use Bet Yosef, so, you know, uh, I don't want to use the salmon. So that's where you have to use your seichel a little bit and understand that some of your chumras should be legabe maybe specific things, but not legabe everything. And for kavod abrios, for sure, uh, you know, you could be makel, right? So one has to understand that. Even plain rabbanut, which again, as I say, in the yeshiva world, plain rabbanut is regarded as treif, basically. Well, it's not treif. The truth is, it's not treif. Uh, the one thing I can say for sure is rabbanut relies on heteromechira, which is a problem area. And number two, regular rabbanut meat is not glut. So, but this is, not, this, is, this is not dishonest. I mean, this is full disclosure that that's what it is. So those are, those are two halachic issues. But can I use uh, rabbanut milchiks? Uh, can I use rabbanut even fruits and vegetables, which are totally untrumous and nitrous? The truth is, again, I hope this is not my last Q&A. <laughs> the truth is, on para vinyanim, a plain rabbanot ashgacha is, and milchik, and milchik inyanim, a plain rabbanot ashgacha is probably, I'm not going to say 100%, a mistake, is probably fine. You have issues of meat, but even the meat is not because of incompetence. It's because uh, it's not glad, or whatever. So the minig of b'nei taira is we want, uh, we want glad. So, in Eretz Israel, a big problem simply is that once again, hashkachos have become politicized. Bells, machzikiyah, hashkacha, which which for many many years was mahadrin hashkacha. I don't eat bells. I asked someone, why? Why not? It's not makubal. You know, you can't you can't get information here. This is the this is the big problem, because everything is connected to political parties as well. Because bells is connected to that. No, no, no. Uh, they, they weren't with Degel Torah, with Rashach, they weren't with the Gurdjieff. Uh, okay, uh, fine. What does that have to do with whether the Hashkacha is a good, is a good Hashkacha? Mm -hmm. So we live in a complicated society where everything is interrelated when they shouldn't necessarily be interrelated. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that, that's the general perspective that uh, some of the Chumras are Chumras Belitam. Okay. Thank you for listening to this awesome Ech production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.